Welcome to the third in our series. Uh, today we're going to talk about stress, rhizobium, and mycorrhizae. It may seem like a strange combination, but in order to cover everything that I want to cover in this uh, four-part series, uh, I had to blend a few things together. Stress has been one of my favorite things in the last little while because every research paper you pick up nowadays, if you're looking at uh, management of plants, there's a, a section on stress management and it covers most of the stuff I'm going to include. So without ado, uh, let's get going. I'm gonna try and get this done um, uh, in less than an hour for sure. Thanks a lot. So we all know, and you've seen this slide before, and uh, I'll go through a few of these real quickly. We know that abiotic stress is really our big factor. Uh, folks have a pretty good handle on biotic stresses, things like diseases, weeds, and insects. And farmers are, are well equipped to spray and control those and use integrated pest managers where possible. So we're gonna focus on how does the plant really deal with these stresses. And you know, last year we had a good example of that when we had canola plants like this wilting in the field come sundown or even early in the morning, Usually by, by morning, the plants have perked right up because of water pressure that will fill those, those cells in the plant and keep them growing. But I'll show you some stuff uh, in the next episode, which uh, ties everything together about what that meant for, for damage. Just to review slightly, we, we basically get stress that occurs as a result of, of living. Just breathing oxygen, both in humans and all animals, uh, so-called eukaryotes, uh, which are those creatures that have multi-cells. We all use oxygen, and in that process, oxygen becomes damaged if we're under stress. And in the plant, specifically when the stomata closes, it's too hot, too sunny, and we're short of some of these kinds of things like CO2, water, oxygen, nitrogen, and sunlight. In fact, sunlight, when it's too much, becomes damaging as it did this past summer when we had extreme heat bright sunny days, a lot of wind pulling moisture out of the plants and the plants not being able to, to cool themselves. So it runs this whole system and it's this system here in photosynthesis in the plant cells that is really responsible along with, with energy production in mitochondria and electron transport. And of course, most of our stresses occur as a function of too little water. I mean, we get excess water in low spots, but on the whole, it's more damaging to have too little water. And when we do, this photosynthesis stops and damage starts occurring. Now, I got to go back and remind uh, everybody about some of the early stuff we took in, in session one, uh, because I'll be talking about these specific organelles that are critical in terms of both creating and managing uh, stress issues. We have the peroxisomes in here. This is where the plant gets rid of things. We have the mitochondria here and here. Uh, there's lots of them in the cell all over the place. Uh, they do the respiration, take the sugar produced here in the chloroplasts. And both of these have electron transport as we covered, photosynthesis and respiration. And those are major causes of the damage. So the plant is always trying to be in a state of homeostasis or balance. And it's moving things around through those transporters we talked about. And it's moving uh, nutrients from the, the root into the shoot. It's moving nutrients everywhere, up and down, as the plant is trying to adjust to things within the cell. And when you don't get adjustment, we get stress. Any deviation from normal optimal conditions that's stress. Specifically in, in plants and in humans, and I'll talk about uh, the human system because it intrigues me and I think everybody needs to know how their system deals with, with oxidative stress because it's, it's a function in us as well. So uh, this will be a big learning experience for those of you who aren't sort of uh, nutrient focused in terms of your eating habits all the time. So oxidative stress reflects an imbalance between the systemic production of reactive oxygen species, ROS, I'll refer to them, and that stands for react reactive oxygen species, and it's sort of linked to free radicals, and a biological system's ability to readily detoxify the reactive intermediates, you know, or to repair the damage. Now, the one thing is reactive oxygen species are very useful in the plant when it's controlled. 
For example, if a disease is affecting a leaf or the stem or the root, the plant will create some of these reactive oxygen species to kill the cells around that infective area in order to prevent the spread of that organism in the plant. So it uses this system as a signaling system to tell itself where there's damage occurring, where cells are being disrupted, and it allows it to do something about it. And it also signals the rest of the cell and the rest of the plant, which triggers hormonal reactions and calcium streaming, which start off a whole bunch of cascades. So there's a, there's a fine balance between too much and too little. And it's when we get overstressed that those reactive oxygen species start causing damage. You know, and it occurs here during electron leaks during photosynthesis and respiration, electron transport. And usually it's because there's too much sun and not enough water. So I think we can say that in 2021, we had a fair amount of ROS production. So what does it mean? And how do plants deal with it? And you are, are sort of familiar with this term antioxidant. So when, a, when oxygen is used in a human being and is stressed, it, it, it sometimes gets a free radical or missing electron in the outer shell. And that becomes damaging because then that, that, that oxygen radical is trying to fill that outer shell. And what antioxidants do, they can contribute electrons to fill that outer shell and remove the damage. So unstable molecules that contain oxygen easily reacts with our molecules in cells, it may cause damage to DNA, RNA, and proteins, it may cause cell death. Reactive oxygen species are free radicals, also called oxygen radicals. So that's what's happening. We've got this, this molecule that's damaged looking to grab things in order to satisfy it, and that causes damage to your cells and your DNA. So these are the kinds of things that bring about that intense light, wounding, herbicides, uh, you know, senescing, ozone, ozone, growth pathogens, and so on. They cause these, and here are the, the free radicals right here, all these little ones. This is peroxide, this is hydroxyl, and these are singlet oxygens and other things. And that leads to oxidative stress, interrupts homeostasis, and we get stress. So as I mentioned here, we got chloroplast, mitochondria, and peroxisomes causing stress, and we get oxidative damage. So let's take a look at that. So here's your mitochondria, here's your chloroplast, here's your peroxisome. So these organisms produce these products, and then these are produced out of there, and we get an oxidative burst. These are enzymes that are involved in breaking these free radicals down. And we have another thing over here called SOD, which I'll get to in a while. They also break down and tie up these free radicals into hydrogen peroxide, which is also toxic, but the plant in the peroxisomes actually then converts that to water using something called catalase and peroxidases. Anyhow, that's sort of just, just for the real geeky guys in the bunch. So, here we have these three radicals right here, superoxide, hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyls, and singlet oxygen. And this is a, a good summary. This is what they look like. But So it attacks the membrane, it attacks the DNA, it attacks the chlorophyll, it attacks the proteins, and all that causes cell death if it isn't controlled. For example, I'll just throw some of these. Uh, toxicity to roots from fertilizers and seedlings can be can be a problem. So, you know, uh, we're, we're always in the, interested in, in producing a product that has very little toxicity. So I do a lot of these kind of stuff. And you can see this is uh, a canola or a wheat root that's coming in contact with a granule of, of fertilizer. And you can see the tip, which is the most exposed, because you see there's nothing covering. There's no signs of damage. Usually the tip is where damage will occur if it's being poisoned, because there's just too much of a toxic material, the fertilizer, ammonia, uh, and there, it'll brown it. You can see that these don't do any of that, even though the, the root tip is running right on the granule. And you can see here that 
uh, the root hairs are actually going into the granule to extract the nutrients, and here's a, a, a lateral root is developing. That product is a new one we're, we're introducing, and I, I'm, I don't promote our products necessarily, but I want to show you that uh, this is a mined product uh, that comes into to the country, uh, and uh, we're just introducing it. But take a look at this, got potassium, calcium, magnesium, and sulfur. One of the issues we have is putting potassium into the seed roll. So this product is a, a relatively low concentration, slow release, and these are the kinds of things we're, we're looking at in terms of reducing that salt index, generally, as we, we talk about, uh, in fertilizers. Here's another system where the plant uh, root actually turns away from too much urea. You can see here that we get damage occurring at those root tips. I won't cover that, but you can also see that the plant is very able to deal with some of that. These three seminal roots here, well, this one's damaged, this one's damaged, but look at this one, this one's all fine. So the plant will survive, but you can see that that damage has an effect on growth and it's stressed. And this is just another shot showing you what that looks like. So how do plants respond and our role in the response? Well, uh, go back to this. Uh, these are sort of the tools we have for nutrients and for, for stress management. We need all of them, but these are the key ones. Phosphorus, sulfur, potassium, calcium, manganese, copper, zinc, and iron. These transition metals are key simply because they can deal with electrons through the shifting of their valences. So they are really key as catalysts to bring about a re reaction that nullifies the effect of the reactive oxygen species. And that's why I bring these up here because I'm gonna cover all of these. I don't talk about phosphorus, it's just that phosphorus is needed as energy for every reaction. And I don't talk about boron. It is also needed for, for a lot of things, but not specifically that I know of in terms of dealing with these reactive oxygen species. And I won't cover this any more than in this one slide where we have drought, salt, heavy metals, and we get reactive oxygen species resulting from all of these, especially these salt issues. And the key thing to take home is that calcium, calcium is, is, uh, is activated and it's really tightly controlled in the vacuole and in, in, the, in the, the, the liquid inside the cell. But calcium, two major roles are in cell wall structure and this role. When a plant is stressed, it uses calcium as a release to tell the cell that there's something going on and it's got sensors that are also helping that. And it triggers into place a whole bunch of basic uh, genes right here that produce all of these things like sod. We talked about catalase. Sod here again, these are all um, uh, sulfur reductive compounds. So the calcium is involved in the triggering, triggering a recognition of the issue and triggering a bunch of reactions in the plant, uh, usually through messenger RNA to the genes or to the nucleus, to bring about the production of these products which deal with it. So I'm going to go. I showed you this before, but I'm going to show you this again just to remind you. Take a look at this. Uh, low phosphorus is very common. Sulfur is common, boron is common, and zinc. These three, zinc, sulfur, and phosphorus, were in that list that I just put up there. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. So this is, again, all of these are occurring, and it has another aspect that is important. Under oxidative stress, the plant will produce a bunch of compounds that in the cell, like the, you won't recognize these, proline is an amino acid very common response first response it produces this amino acid to put more solutes into the cell glycine b10 is also a nitrogen compound polyamines are hormones so the plant brings these osmolites and i'll define in a minute into the cell to help it scavenge and also to protect it and that gives you abiotic stress tolerance it quenches the R uh, reactive oxygen species and that is, we've talked about, this is triggered in that response. We get a perception of the problem. We get transcriptional 
control where, where genes are activated and we get a response. And those responses, osmoprotection, chaperones, water movement, detoxification with these compounds. So you get the picture. There's a group of compounds that are produced by the plant in response to the stress. And here they are. Antioxidants are compounds that inhibit oxidation. So we, you know, in everyday life, we talk about antioxidants, things like lycopene and tomatoes, colorants in strawberries and blueberries. Let's dig a little deeper into that. I already talked about these soluble, uh, compatible solute, uh, solutes, proline, glycine, and so on. So I'll, I'll give you a little bit more in a minute. But let's take a look at these antioxidants. Ascorbate, vitamin C, glutathione, sulfur compound, tocopherol, vitamin E, carotenoids, all of those colors in blueberries, strawberries, tomatoes, and so on. Those are the antioxidants that the plant uses, and it produces it to deal with those stresses. And then we as humans eat those plants to get exactly the same thing. Vitamin C is key to our health. Glutathione, key, and I'll talk a lot about glutathione in a minute. Vitamin E and so on. These antioxidants, then we have enzymatic antioxidants. Right here, catalase, uh, superoxide desmutase, and a whole bunch of other compounds we don't have to worry about. The plant also has to use hormones to send messages. Abscisic acid, gibberellins, auxin, ethylene, cytokinins, salicylic acid, uh, jasmanic acid, racinosteroids. All of those things are responding to the stress. So osmolites are highly soluble, uncharged, and non-toxic organic molecules like proline, beta gly glycine beta and so on and the hormones are also used to trigger the biosynthesis remember a plant only has those five ingredients and it has the, the genetics to synthesize all of these things so now let's take a look at what we can do uh, i went through and it's and it's fairly complicated although it's relatively simple way to look at it now that you know what's going on, all you have to know is that the plant has the capability to do all of that. And it does it genetically by upregulating and downregulating genes. And all we have to do is recognize that that's what's happening, provide the nutrients that support that, do what we can to deal with water by looking after our land, um, preventing compaction, uh, covering a uh, low spots, getting rid of salinity, reducing acidity. Those are the things that we can do along with these nutrients and the plant will look after the rest genetically. So here's what we have to start. And most of you guys are now using sulfur in a much bigger way than you used to, but sulfur is key for a lot of things. You know, enhances root development, increases productivity. Those are general terms, you know, you can use for everything. Promotes biological nitrogen fixation. I'll cover that in a little while where, where sulfur is really important. Increases uptake of NPKs. Works against different stresses. Increases photosynthesis. Synthesizes amino acids because we need sulfur in two amino acids. And that's what generally people talk about. Activates different enzymes and vitamins. Helps in chlorophyll formation. And you notice this in the Mulder chart, there's no sulfur. There's no sulfur indicated because sulfur doesn't seem to interfere with or interact badly with anything. Now let's take a closer look at sulfur because you know I can't help myself from an agronomic perspective to, to teach as I go. Plants cannot use sulfate, even though we put sulfate in the ground and we get sulfate, uh, sulfur dioxide from the air, but uh, we, we, we can't really use that sulfur dioxide. So it's got to be reduced, just like nitrate. The plant takes up nitrate, but it can't use it. It has to convert it to ammonium before it can be used. Same with sulfate. 
So that process takes more energy actually than reducing nitrogen. So it reduces down to a sulfide and it creates the amino acid as a way to utilize it in cells as cysteine. Cysteine then you can form methionine out of that and you can produce pro proteins. And the key thing from a stress management is the formation of glutathione. Now, um, if you're at all uh, sort of been looking at your own health relative to the outbreak here, uh, one of the things that uh, is commonly recommended is that we increase our uptake of glutathione to deal with COVID. Well, really what you don't wanna do is take up glutathione because the human body uses glutathione for the same purpose that plants do along with uh, vitamin C. What you wanna take up is cysteine because it's the sulfur in the, in the cysteine that the plant needs because it's an essential amino acid for, for animals because we can't produce them uh, as human beings. So we take uh, what's called N-acetylcysteine and from that, our human body will produce the glutathione. Because it, you know, if you just take glutathione into your gut, your microbes will sort of chew it up and you won't get glutathione out of it. You'll get maybe a little bit of sulfur. So we, we, that's what we, what, you know, a side note, but here's what's happened. 1990, we had acid rain all over the place in the East. 2000 less, 210 even less. And now we don't have enough and you guys are putting it on the ground now because the plants are sucking it up and we can't get enough in. We take a look at that demand. That demand, like all curves, this huge, huge demand up to bloom time. And then boof, down we get leveling off when you know that tremendous amount of sulfur goes into canola. So most guys are putting down either elemental or biosol or ammonium sulfate or some sort of sulfur compound, uh, sulfur plus uh, nowadays in order to supplement in the canola year because the demand for sulfur is higher, but all plants need sulfur, uh, some less than, than others. And you need a ratio because you, you, you know, most of your amino acids, and we talk about the ratio for amino acids, most of your amino acids are contain nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, only two, methionine and cysteine, are in, uh, need sulfur. So, you know, say canola would have a uh, an N2S ratio of maybe six and uh, per wheat would be 10 and so on. So it, it varies depending on the crop, but basically the higher the protein, the more nitrogen, more sulfur you need as you produce proteins. So here's glutathione, we talked about it. And the key part of this process in the plant is that the scorbate vitamin C glutathione cycle. And that's the same in human beings. We need the vitamin C, we need the glutathione to scavenge what we in humans call free radicals, but they're also reactive oxygen species. And in fact, methionine, for example, in sulfur is key in producing ethylene, polyamines, and glycine betan. So the methionine is also key in the biosynthesis of a whole lot of compounds in the plant, including hormones like ethylene, ethylene and polyamines, and some of those osmolites. Remember, there's only five ingredients going to the plant with the nutrients, and then we, the plant produces the rest. Potassium next. Well, I put this back in here and take a look at potassium. And you can see here, as we just discussed in other programs, when you have too much potassium is stored in the vacuole and you have too much uh, phosphorus, it is also stored in the vacuole. But potassium does a tremendous amount in the plant, even though it isn't really incorporated into molecules as such, it's more of a something that is used for processing. It's enzyme activation, membrane transport, stomatal movement, we cover that stress resistance, photosynthesis, osmoregulation, it's the potassium that gives you the cell turgor, it gives it the turgor pressure in the roots to push the roots through the ground. So potassium is key. You know, uh, I, I just covered most of that right here, but it's under, uh, uh, out of all the mineral nutrients, potassium plays a particularly critical role in plant growth and metabolism, and it contributes greatly to, the, greatly to the survival of plants that are under various biotic and abiotic stresses. 
enzyme activation, protein synthesis, we cover this. And, and one of the things I noticed over the years I was with, with Agrotrin, which was a tremendous learning experience to hang out with a lot of really smart people for a long time, is that when it came to looking at one nutrient that seemed to be related to really good productivity when you're looking at variable rate and you're looking at zonations, was the level of potassium. Generally, there was a, a really good correlation with high levels of potassium and, and good productivity. And you can you can look at these, but it's involved in all kinds of, you know, improves reactive oxygen species balances. It's involved in water retention. And one of the things about potassium, remember, it's, it's about water. And we learned when we looked at stomata that potassium is key to the regulation and closing of the stomata through through the pressures in the guard cells. So when the plant is under severe stress by heat, the roots aren't getting water, the plant can't get phosphor, uh, potassium to regulate those stomata very uh, efficiently. And man, that, that's horrendously important to the plant to be able to respond very quickly to those signals. So you also wind up with potassium, which isn't very mobile in the soil, if at all, as the roots go down under drought, there's less and less potassium. As you go deeper, the plant is struggling. So, so there's a, a horrendous impact of drought on the plant for many, many reasons. Here's potassium, uh, again, used by everybody, got peaks in it. And typically you'll see this drop off here after pollination as the plant needs less and less uh, potassium in order to bring about a whole bunch of processes in the plant. But it's really, really key as are all nutrients going into this building period, because no matter what happens after here, if you've got lots built up in that growth phase, the plant can mobilize many, many of those nutrients, not all of them, but many of them, NPK, magnesium, you know, big, big builders and big important uh, nutrients in the plant. And it will, pull it up after that as well, but it loses its ability because it shifts the sink to the seeds from, from growing the tissue in the roots. Now here's the big important one, the superoxide desmutase. So if you've got these three radicals here and you react them and you get hydrogen peroxide and oxygen, and then other things happen, here are the key nutrients. Manganese, a manganese superoxide, that helps break down those free radicals in the mitochondria. An iron superoxide in the chloroplast. And the copper zinc superoxide in the chloroplast and also in the cystal. That's the, that's the liquid within the cell. These, uh, again, they got tremendous valence capability to, to change and therefore to help with that electron issue. In the copper zinc sod, uh, although zinc is classified as, as a transition metal, it doesn't change valence. It's the copper that changes valence, but the copper won't work without the zinc. So that combination, it's really the copper that does all the work, but you need the zinc there for both. And uh, you know what? Here's the human system. What do we got for anti The sods, the same ones, the catalases, the carotenoids, these are sulfur reductive processes, vitamin C, vitamin E, and again, glutathione. It's not surprising. We're multi-celled organisms like plants. Plants use the same systems as humans. They've just been here a whole lot longer and developed that long before we as a species came along. So if you learn nothing else, you learn that these are the kind of things you need to look after yourself. Even a lot of skin cancers are related to reactive oxygen species because of excess heat, exposure to sunlight. These same enzymes and antioxidants help in preventing those kinds of issues. Anyhow, learning experience for today. So let's take a look, see. Zinc, deficient quite a bit. This Saskatchewan issue over to Eastern Alberta. Quite a problem. So nutrients such as zinc, manganese, copper, iron, magnesium, boron, calcium, sulfur, and potassium can, mo can modify the activities of several antioxidant enzymes. 
With these and other essential plant nutrients, the plant can defend itself to the best of its ability. And that's all there is to stress. Your challenge is to provide that to the plant during the whole growing season. That's really the challenge. Let's go on to rhizobium. Uh, I just want to point out a little bit about uh, the people who pr pr provided because I, I've been to their facility in Quebec. Premier Tech is really, really important uh, and a hidden jewel in Canada as far, far as I'm concerned. They control the, the peat moss business basically worldwide. And uh, there are about 4,700 people in, the, in it in the company in 28 countries with 47 manufacturing facilities in 16 countries. This company never heard of, unless you saw some of these products. Promix, your peat, Wilson, domestic pesticides, CIL, Alaskan ice melter, all that stuff we use for melting ice. Those are all products from Premier Tech, along with a whole bunch of other ones that are involved in, in filtering of water and so on got phenomenal facilities in Quebec that uh, uh, everyone should see. And they provide both our mycorrhizae and our rhizobium. So here's uh, the issue with a rhizobium. It fixes nitrogen. The problem with nitrogen is that it's got this triple bond right here, which makes it so stable in the atmosphere. The, the, the nitrogen in the atmosphere stabilizes at 78% almost all the time. And when you break it down, you get ammonia, which is then converted to ammonium, uh, so it's not toxic. And it takes a tremendous amount of energy, it takes 16 ATP in order to break one of these darn uh, molecules, because each one of those has to be broken one at, a, one at a time, and it takes a horrendous amount of energy. The only other thing that can do this is lightning. Lightning has got enough electricity in it to break those in a lightning strike, and it provides about six to seven percent of the fixed nitrogen for plants worldwide annually. The rest of it we get from things like urea, where we actually handle that process uh, with a catalyst. So let's look at the bacteria, and here we can see is a is a, a mutualistic symbiosis. In other words, the bacteria in here uh, cooperate with the plant, and they're both both happy. And this is uh, just an alfalfa or P, uh, sorry, a P nodule. And you can see that this is new growth, this is fixing, and this is dying. So it's got an indeterminate kind of process. And we know that all these plants like chickpeas produce nitrogen, uh, fixed nitrogen, soybeans, lentils, alfalfa is a tremendous fixer of nitrogen, peas. And you look at faba beans also uh, as an annual crop fixes a lot of nitrogen, a great crop for us if we could develop a market for, for faba beans. A couple of things uh, we'll just talk about. Take a look at peas. Uh, uh, peas use a lot more zinc than pretty well anything else we grow on a per bushel basis. And you take a look at soybeans, uh, they not so much, but they use a lot of manganese. And, and part of the manganese issue with soybeans is the way the soybean uh, fixes this nitrogen and the way it has to handle it. it takes a lot of uh, manganese in order to to process the product out of the fixation. Uh, but uh, take, uh, zinc uh, is really really key uh, in peas. Uh, I want to point that out because it's it's outside of that it's not not nothing else to really talk about there. Uh, the other thing I've talked about is look at look at the root systems on legumes. And I think the reason they're so poor is because they've evolved with rhizobium, so they don't need a massive root system. So you look at faba beans, they're a very small root system. This is kilometers per meter squared uh, root system uh, that, you know, I think I talked about before, but I, I remind you here, uh, you know, in potatoes are pretty big, canola is really big, but you take a look at soybeans, uh, Pigeon peas, are, we don't grow here, but uh, this doesn't include, include peas. But legumes as a whole have a small system, so they use uh, nitrogen fixation to help them out. Uh, I showed you this earlier. This is where, where uh, lateral roots develop right here in this paracycle, this little yellow part. Well, the nodules start there as well. So the way a rhizobium gets in contact with the 
with the legume is if the plant is giving off some flavonoids, the microbes are giving off node factors to signal to the plant. They swim over to the root hair, and there's a calcium spike when they interact that signals the plant that there's action going on. So what happens, the plant root hair encapsulates it, the bacteria, excuse me, uh, bacteria start growing, uh, move down into the uh, pericy uh, pericycle, and the plant then grows the nodule and the bacteria multiplying there. Uh, and that's what happens, and then they start fixing nitrogen. And we'll go into that process. And then with uh, with mycorrhizae, though, it's a little bit different. Uh, we get the fungus coming along. It also has mycofactors, and there's a, a hormone signal here with strignol, strignolactins, which allow the, the organism to get into the, into the root, and then it forms these arbuscules, and I'll show you that more. Mycorrhizae are ancient. They're probably 450 million or so years old. Rhizobium are only about 60 million years old, and they sort of copied the, the process that mycorrhizae had. So here's the curling that occurs, and this is one I think I got. You can also get entry right here at this exit where the lateral roots come out in legumes. There's two kinds of nodules. These are the, the typical kind we have here in most of our plants, and, and this is a soybean nodule, so a determinant nodule, and I'll just show you those. I'm not gonna talk a lot about soybeans, but they handle their products differently. The determinant nodule legumes primarily transport allotonin and allotoate ureates as fixed compounds, while indeterminate nodules assimilate amines, amides, in the form of asparagine and glutamine, which are two amino acids. I told you that soybeans use a lot more manganese because they have to process this to ammonium, and that takes a fair amount of manganese, much more uh, than typical in a plant, whereas the nodules and indeterminate ones like our peas and lentils and alfalfa and chickpeas. Um, I'm not sure about chickpeas. I would maybe take that back, but the rest of those produce it as asparagine and glutamine and they don't have to process it any further. You can use it right away. So here's soybean nodules, they're nice and round. Here's one, you can see it's a young one and you can see it's growing right here from next to the xylem and phloem that pericycle I talked about. And here as they develop, you can see uh, they're fixing because they're nice and red and the uh, soybean nodules are nice and round. They determine it so they get fixing, they fix, and then they stop fixing and give it all, all to the plant. And here's another shot showing the same thing, right? Nice, nicely fixing. As they age, gives up all that nutrient slowly and then it's dead and it's gone. Here's an indeterminate one piece, alfalfa lentils, and you can see I showed you this before, it's different. This is fixing, this is new meristematic tissue, so it's gonna produce more um, material for the bacteria, and here it's kind of dying. These are lentils, the same kind of process goes on in all these. As they age, you can see this is losing its fixing capabilities and it's deteriorating, it's old, boom, it's done. Now here's one thing, <clears throat> under phosphate starvation, the phosphate acquisition rate increases in nodules to make them less vulnerable compared to other organs. Nodules are a sink for molybdenum and phosphorus, and you may see when you're having fixation that your plants will stall for 10, 12 days and just do nothing. And you're wondering what's going on. Well, they're making nodules and they're using up most of the P and some of the molybdenum. Uh, to do that. Now I talked about molybdenum. Now uh, there's two enzymes that are key in nodulation. This one here called nitrogenase, which is used as the catalyst for the breakdown of the nitrogen into ammonia. The other one is leg hemoglobin, which gives you the red color, and it's used to control the level of oxygen in the nodule. This one contains sulfur plus molybdenum, and I'll show you that. And this one contains cobalt. Now, nitrogenase will not work in any fixing organism, and that even includes free-living 
uh, rhizobium bacteria that you know people are bringing to the market now out of the, sh the sugar cane kind of episode. <clears throat> they use nitrogenase as well. Now, nitrogenase will not work at regular oxygen levels. So the leg hemoglobin is used to lower the oxygen level to a point where the microbes have enough oxygen to metabolize, but not so high that the nitrogenase won't work. So here's nitrogenase, and you can see there's a lot of sulfur, a lot of iron, and molybdenum to do that process. Well, this looks complicated, but, but it really uh, isn't when you look at it. Uh, you can see here that this is a, a, a nodule. So we, we got sulfur transporters, molybdenum transporters, iron transporters, magnesium transporters, all kinds of transporters that are in plasma membranes of cells and all kinds of cells that are using, used to transport nutrients around in the plant. We get sugar from the plant, comes into the nodule. The nodule uses it in, to produce energy in terms of ATP. Uh, and it fixes the, the ammonium, ammonia, converts it to ammonium because ammonia is toxic. So it converts it to ammonium and then processes it into asparagine. And away she goes. And the glutamine. Just that simple. And that all happens genetically. One thing we don't, didn't know until recently is that <clears throat> molybdenum cannot be used by itself. It's always a, a cofactor and it can't be produced without the presence of copper. Just that easy. Can't be done. The other thing that's interesting about molybdenum, which happens to be one of my pets, is there's only five enzymes that contain molybdenum, but one of them is this one, aldehyde oxidase. That is a molecule that is used, an enzyme, that is used in the last stage of production of abscisic acid. So as tiny amount as molybdenum is needed, it has a lot of uses. So fixation, fixation is based on carbon because we need carbon in order to grow everything, low oxygen to protect nitrogen and rapid export of N via the xylem. It needs calcium, it needs phosphorus in huge amounts. It needs sulfur for that leg hemoglobin level. It needs iron in the nitrogenase. It needs cysteine and methionine and sulfur. Here's some work that shows with high sulfur levels, you get much bigger no uh, nodules. Boron is important. And the reason boron is important along with, with calcium is that the plant grows the nodule. Whenever you have cells growing, you have calcium in the cell walls, and the boron is used as the glue to make, make all those sort of uh, rebar that go into the uh, nodule and into the cell wall. So there's a big demand for boron during this growth phase, and throughout the plant's life there's a demand, but the calcium boron mix in the formation of nodules puts a lot of stress in getting that boron into the plant if you're really boron deficient. Talked about that, molybdenum we talked about. Uh, one little thing for your folks is that you'll notice that molybdenum becomes less available as the pH drops, especially if you get down below 5.5. Most other uh, micronutrients like copper, manganese, boron are more readily available at lower pHs and less available at high pHs. So folks that are growing legumes where their pH is low, and I did quite a bit of stuff in Idaho uh, back a few years ago where they got really acid soils and it, it made a huge, huge difference. Uh, 50 grams per acre of molybdenum will do the job. And here's uh, the key things that are not good for production of nodules. Excess moisture, not enough carbon, not enough sugar, drought. The rhizobium can't handle it, can't be fed properly. Soil acidity, they don't like acid soils. P deficiency will be a hamper things. Excess mineral N. And I'll spend just a second here because I might forget about it in the next presentation. Question always comes up, you know, what happens if we got high nitrate levels? Well, if you got high nitrate levels, the plant will be lazy and not produce nodules simply because it is less expensive 
to extract nitrogen from soil, if there's lots of it there, than it is to build a nodule and spend all that energy build, building it. So the plant is lazy. It'll get more than about 50 pounds for sure, you won't get it. But you do need nitrogen before modulation comes into play, which is 30 days, 35, 40 days after seeding, to grow the plant. So you do need some nitrogen. It's not a W10, you just don't want too darn much. And deficiencies in all those nutrients. And that's that for rhizobium. Lastly, mycorrhizae. People don't know a whole lot about mycorrhizae, but you will after this. Mycorrhizae are ancient. They, they uh, figure based on uh, historic fossils that mycorrhizae were there almost at the time that plants, which likely emerged from cyanobacteria, which were fixing uh, nitrogen before anything else, uh, long ago. And if you look at this, uh, this material here, if you can see it, this sort of fuzzy stuff around there, that's called glomulin. And, and that is attributed, or, or a lot of people attribute that to formation of soil clusters. In other words, that release of those uh, materials are the basis of forming clusters or glues to hold soil particles together to form aggregates. And, you know, in forests and so on, that is, is really key. And in forests and sandy land, my, mycorrhizae are predominant. Almost 70% of all plants have mycorrhizae. Here's just a shot showing how microbes and rhizobium and other things around mycorrhizae uh, can feed from the exudates that are given off by the mycorrhizae as they're taking sugars from the plant out to grow and pulling nutrients back to the plant to feed the plant. So which plants require mycorrhizae? For me, the simple answer is plants with really poor roots, plants that can't extract nutrients very well. One of the best uses of mycorrhizae is on flax. It's got a very small root. It's not great at picking up P especially, followed by legumes and sunflower, wheat, barley, oats, rye very low, and canola does not have mycorrhizae. And I think that's the reason why canola has developed and evolved separately and has much better rooting capacity to extract nutrients from the soil because it had to. P fertility following non dam crops is important. If you have canola, and especially put canola on canola, uh, which does not support uh, mycorrhizae, or vascular mycorrhizae, uh, you're not going to have much there for the next crop. And as a consequence, you should probably be inoculating after you've grown canola, because we know that the plants have trouble building up high enough volumes of mycorrhizae after canola from natural sources. And if you're, for example, in the old days when we did not summer fallow, there were a year or maybe even two years where there was nothing for the mycorrhizae to survive on, and we lost a lot of them. Rye is very low and buckwheat is also very low, and buckwheat is also another great scavenger. So I think there's evolutionary reasons why uh, we don't have uh, uh, plants that are all dealing with mycorrhizae and some actually do really well like canola. Group of fungi that form relationships with plants. It's a win-win situation. For me, the key thing to, to take, the take home message is here's a root hair. Here's relative mycorrhizal a hyphae. Now root hair, we think it's small, but there's a lot of micro spaces in the soil where both water and nutrients are held that the root hairs can't get to. The mycorrhizae can because the hyphae are extremely small. So we know that the mycorrhizae during drought help prevent 
desiccation of the plant because they can access those tiny, tiny pores where water is held along with nutrients. And they can also extract nutrients much further away from the root hair because that's only a couple of millimeters. Whereas these can go up to eight, 10 centimeters away and extract nutrients from a much broader area and also extract water from a much broader area. So that's really, to me, the secret behind mycorrhizae. And they're symbiotic. I showed you earlier that the plants have to agree to cooperate. Otherwise, the plant would recognize it as a bad guy and try to kill it. So mycorrhizae are important for plant nutrition, soil biology, and soil chemistry because they provide uh, exudates, so to speak, of carbon into the soil, which microbes need. And the two big classes of, of crops that do not have it are the Brassicaceae and the Canidopoceae. Canidopo. The pigweeds, let's just call it that way. I'm having trouble pronouncing that right at the moment. And about 70% of all plant species, including many crops such as wheat and rice, have mycorrhizae. And they're also involved, some implication in, in disease control, but drought and also salinity resistance because they can extract water. Uh, Kinopodium is what I was looking at here, uh, which are all the pigweeds. And, and you know if you've got pigweeds, they do very well because they've got great roots and the ability to extract nutrients. So uh, here we, you know, in, in summary, and we're almost done here, uh, the, the mycorrhizae can go way beyond the root zone. And they can extract all of these things. They're not just extracting phosphorus. It was always believed that extracting phosphorus was key, and probably it was uh, when phosphorus is low, but it will also have all of these nutrients because they need them as well and they access moisture in the micropores and they increase tolerance. Now, here's how it works. The spore germinates, the root colonization occurs, the hyphae network develops, and the hyphae nutrients and water are uptaken. And here's just a shot of those arbuscules. And all the arbuscule is kind of like a big root itself so that there's a huge surface area to exchange uh, nutrients coming in to the plant cell and to extract sugar and carbon coming from the plant cell. So that's just common sense. Now take a look at this. Here we have the spores. And uh, closely look at what's going on in the hyphae. You'll notice that there are things moving in both directions in the hyphae, just like we saw in the other video. And those are mobile vacuoles. So some of it is moving back to the plant and the rest is moving away from the plant all at the same time. Oops. So what we've done is just given the plant a huge, huge root system that it didn't have before, in short. 10 times more efficient and 100 times more efficient than that of roots. So that's the role of, of mycorrhizae. And the one that we sell is a very commonly one sold worldwide, Glomus, Glomus interradices. And you can see that uh, here we have vesicles which are storage cells in the, inside the, uh, the hyphae under high magnification. Now, here's some shots I, I took uh, at home here. And you can see these are all spores. That's how they survive. And you can see the mycorrhizae filaments running around. And here are some spores germinating. And the one thing you want to be, if you're buying mycorrhizae, you only want to get spores. This is damage, it doesn't do anything. Any kind of fragments don't do anything. Any of that have, have germinated before you shove them into the ground won't do anything, they're dead. And that's the beauty of, of uh, Premier Tech. Uh, they got some phenomenal research people who basically have figured out how to do this. One of the few companies worldwide and the secret is well kept. And things that interfere with that are things like chemical use, tillage. I mean, the more stable you are, the better elimination of synthetic fertilizers. Uh, excessive amounts of fertilizers, of course, uh, the plant doesn't uh, need as much mycorrhizae and um, it likely inhibits, especially high levels of phosphorus will inhibit the activity of these. And living plants are, are important. And when we talk about uh, 
uh, regenerative agriculture and multi-species, we uh, actually can transfer nutrients from one species to other through the mycorrhizae because the mycorrhizae, the same hyphal group will infect uh, two or three or four different plants and actually move nutrients around in forests, uh, basically the whole underground and control of uh, signals in plants is controlled by mycorrhizae. And uh, I just put this up here. There's a new organism coming in, a Serendipita indica, which has also got this name. It's a uh, an organism that uh, uh, produces, or a fungi that produces a hyphae as well, and it promotes bioactive uh, substance accumulation, reduces disease uh, uh, incidence, increases plant growth, increases nutrient acquisition, improve uh, uh, rhizo rhizosphere um, microbium activity feeds it. So this is coming about and we're just, just on the early stages of introducing it. And in case any of you guys didn't know, um, uh, Taurus sells liquid injection kits for rhizobium so, and mycorrhizae, so if you need them. And I finish off with this. I love this one because you can see that the uh, the nutrients and, and carbon are moving in, in both directions. Well, that's the end for today and uh, hope you enjoyed that, learn something. Uh, it's a lot. Um, I, I perhaps give you more than you need, but it, once you understand, you just have to believe in the plants. Uh, for next time, I would suggest that we spend at least an hour and maybe 20 minutes as we look at how do you tie this all into one crop cycle, and I use uh, canola, wheat, and peas. Thanks a lot. See you again.